With any new technology comes opportunity, and some e-commerce companies move pretty fast to take advantage of that mobile opportunity, but you know who moves faster? Fraudsters, so let's talk about it. Hi, I'm Daniel Burstein, Director of Editorial Content at Marketing Sherpa. We are here at the Marketing Sherpa Media Center at IRCE, and joining me now is Don Bush, the VP of Marketing from Count. Thanks for joining us, Don. Thanks, Daniel, glad to be here. So Don, you brought us some data about uh, mobile revenue. So you want to tell us how you came about this data? Sure, every year for about the last five years, we've looked at how mobile commerce is starting to trend and change the industry, and it really has over the last few years. And um, about five years ago, we started doing a mobile payments and fraud survey worldwide. So uh, this year's version, we had about 600 merchants participate and they fill out a survey asking all kinds of questions from how they use mobile, where they use it, why they use it, some of the problems they have, tools that they use to transact and so forth, to give us a feel for where we are in the industry and how folks are using mobile to their advantage. Okay, and uh, what, what did you learn? So what, what kind of trends have you seen over the years and, and which industries are most adapting to mobile? You know, you, you could look at the industries and almost guess which ones are doing really good with mobile. Online games, do a lot with mobile. Gaming outside of the United States is big on mobile. Things like travel services and things like that that um, on the go people need on a regular basis. Um, things like apparel, a little bit less, but still people do a lot with their phone. Um, maybe not a purchase, but a lot of looking. Maybe not a complete transaction, but they do a lot of their homework on their phones or their mobile devices, iPads and things like that. So who are the, who are the laggers? The laggards a lot are things like um, financial services, where they want that person-to-person -person touch. You can do a lot of research on there, but you can't do a lot of transacting until once you've got an account set up, and then you can do a lot of different things with your account. Yeah, I see half of insurance companies are getting less than 5% of their revenue from mobile. Yeah, insurance companies are also one of those things that, um, often because of regulation, a phone or a, a mobile device just is not a really great device for looking through a bunch of paperwork, signing a bunch of information, uh, those types of things. So it let, makes it a little less um, easy for folks to transact that way. Sure, it makes sense. Uh, so you told me something very interesting when we were talking about this data. So it's helpful to see the industries and who's getting the most from, uh, you know, most of the revenue from mobile. But you were saying that really a lot of companies don't even know. They're not sure, they're just guessing. How, how many? Well, in our survey, about 42% of the customers that we see could not tell you what type of device was transacting with them. Whether it was a laptop, a smart television, a mobile phone, an iPad, they couldn't tell you where the transaction was coming from. That's a little bit alarming, especially from our standpoint in fraud mitigation. If you don't know the device that's being used, you really give up a lot of information as to how to stop fraudulent transactions from occurring. So now we've heard a lot in the brick and mortar space about these new chip card readers and how uh, you know credit card companies are trying to shift a lot of the burden onto the retailers to use these. Uh, but you can't use that on a mobile device. You can't use that on a landing page. So what's the relationship between e-commerce sites and financial services companies, credit card companies right now? You know, it's interesting because the chip and pen, as we call it, or EMV, uh, actually is technology that was developed back in 1995. So it's 21 years old and we're just implementing it today. When it was designed, it was designed to stop credit card counterfeiting. So people that would create a credit card and take it to a store and try and use it. Well, today, that really doesn't have any relevance at all to online shopping. So just because I have a card with chip and pin doesn't do anything to stop mitig or mitigate fraud online. It does help the merchants at the store level to transfer that liability. So two years ago, when chip and pin wasn't established here, if I took a fraudulent or counterfeit card to a merchant and the bank approved that transaction, the bank held all the liability. Um, excuse me, reverse that. The merchant held all the uh, liability for that transaction. If the merchant has chip and pin reading and they accept a chip card and there's a fraudulent transaction, that liability shift over to the bank now. So it actually helps the merchant makes it more difficult for fraudsters to create fraud in store, but it doesn't do anything online. And in fact, it actually takes a lot of those entities, we call them cyber gangs or uh, criminal elements, now that they can't take those cards in the store anymore, they go online because it's easier online than it was in the past. 
Okay, so online becomes an even bigger problem, and online, the e-commerce company still bears all the liability, right? Online, they still bear all the liability. In other countries and regions, let's take uh, the UK, for instance, when they implemented chip and pin about seven, eight years ago, they saw their online fraud raised by three, four, five hundred percent over the next 12 months. Now, we haven't seen quite that rise yet, but it's trending that way. In the fourth quarter of last year, we saw about a 21% increase. First quarter of this year, we saw about a 23% increase. So it's definitely going up, but right now only about 40% of brick and mortar merchants have implemented the chip and pen. So it hasn't been implemented widely yet. Okay, so now uh, one way to overcome this, I would think, or at least the first step is to understand how many of your transactions are occurring on mobile, what transactions. So not only would this help with fraud, it would help you better understand your customer and how to sell that customer. So what, what are some baby steps uh, some companies can take who aren't there yet? You know, it's always better to know more about your customer, and there's no place on an e-commerce website that gives you more data than the payment. Because the payment, you know, how they paid, what they used to pay, how much their shopping cart was worth, what was in the shopping cart, what time of day, where were they located, all these wonderful things that, as a marketer, you would want to know about your customer. All that information is there. What we think they should do is do an audit of their payment and their fraud system, to see what they can do and what their limitations are. Visibility is the key. The more visibility I have into every transaction that comes through my system, the better I can service them, the better I can stay away from fraud, the better I can grow my business and give customers more attention that they need. So knowing that information is really critical across a broad spectrum of business needs. Um, they can work with their payment service provider to help collaborate with them and helping them do those types of things as well. Okay, so let's say, so I understand how an audit can be helpful, but let's say I'm a small e-commerce site, right? I don't have the time, the resources to put in a full audit. Is there, is there one specific place or two places I can look at? Where are some of the weakest links, perhaps? Some of the weakest links are, your checkout page is obviously the weakest link. It's, what am I asking for? Do I need all that information? What do I do with all that information? And how do I use that information to help keep me safe and service my customer best? Look at your checkout page. Oftentimes, just looking through that, you can find things that maybe you don't need or maybe you should add to help you be safe with that transaction. And I would think asking less information would help more transactions anyway, because it'd be less friction for the customer. So there's a... It certainly helps with mobile as, as well. If I'm on my mobile device, which I am a lot, I can't fill out a five-page checkout form. I, I just probably wouldn't do it. I'd go somewhere else. The easier they can make it, by act, asking only for the information they're going to use is, is critical. So let's say that you want to download um, a mobile app and it's an e-commerce, excuse me, it's a, uh, an e-device, it's an application, it's an app for my phone. There's no reason I need somebody's address because I'm not shipping them anything. Can I get by without asking for their address? Most times, yes. So why ask a customer to fill out their address for shipping information, which they're never going to use as part of the transaction. Yeah, well, I think many e-commerce uh, companies assume they need it for the credit card processing, right? They can, but there's other ways, again, working with your processor to say, how can I mitigate this, make it easier for the customer, and still protect me? They can work in collaboration with their processor. They can get a lot done, and it might be surprising to them. Okay, lastly, let me ask a very forward-looking question. Maybe not too far forward, but, so we see a lot with mobile payment, mobile, I'm sorry, mobile wallets, and mm -hmm. Bitcoin, and some of these things. How do you think that's going to shake out over the next few years, both for mobile payment and also for fraud and security? You know, in the last couple of years, we've seen a lot of innovation in payments, especially e-commerce and now mobile. I think the last number I looked at for 2015, we saw about 20 new payment types introduced into the market. Um, it's not going to change, not for a little while. Usually in markets you see them expand and then they start to contract as, as they um, uh, merge and do other services and things like that. I think we're going to see that continue for a little while. I think you're going to see other things. Smart TVs now are becoming places to transact. It's mostly movies and other services like that, but they're becoming critical. Things that set up recurring billing so that I don't have to go through all the checkout process. I just say, yes, this is me and they can verify that are going to be more and more accepted as we go on. Yeah, Amazon's trying to make it where every product you can just push a button and get more of it, right? That's it, that's <laughs> correct. I think one other thing that we'll need to be careful of going forward, and um, millennials are probably most susceptible to this, is they're not as security-minded as maybe the generation before them is. 
they're free to give away their information because they want to get information or other things back. And then we see a trend that that is starting to become a liability to them and they need to watch out for that too. So there's a, there's a great symbiotic balance there, what I give for what I get and being careful with my information. Okay, well thanks for stopping by and sharing thank your you. data, Dom. Appreciate it. And thank you for watching. You can get many more e-commerce tips, tactics, and data at marketingsherpa.com slash IRCE.